We definitely have a very uh, thinking crowd. We've got a pile of questions, and I apologize in advance if we can't get to your particular question, but we have three people reviewing them to find those that we think might be most pertinent to the heart of the matter that we're discussing today. That is the array of issues related to justification by faith. Um, our procedure for our time together here is we are going to give each of the plenary presenters a chance to respond to the others in up to a 15-minute uh, segment of time. Each of them will go in turn. We will begin with Tom Schreiner and then to Frank Thielman and then finally to Tom Wright. Following that, we will have a period of discussion among the panelists up here where we can freely discuss the various issues uh, and differences, and then we will turn to the questions that you submitted and discuss them. So I want to turn the microphone over then to Tom Schreiner, and we'll give you 15 minutes, Tom, to uh, provide your response. Well, thank you so much, uh, Clint. Uh, let me begin by commenting on Frank. Can't hear me. Let me begin by commenting on Frank uh, Thielman's paper. The depth and clarity of Frank's scholarship is on display in his essay, as he shows his considerable knowledge not only of the scriptures, but of the Greco-Roman world. His appeal to Roman coinage in defense of his view is particularly interesting so that we see his creativity in proposing another dimension to the phrase the kaiosune theu. Frank concludes that the phrase refers in Romans 1.17 to God's saving righteousness, the gift of righteousness granted to sinners, and to God's fairness and equity in offering salvation to all people equally. I have read widely in Frank's work and I have learned much from him and resonate and agree with almost everything he says. Furthermore, we are, if I understand him correctly, on the same page theologically when it comes to justification. But the question before us today is Frank's assessment of God's righteousness in Romans 1.17. First, and my comments here are quick, let's assume for a moment that Frank is correct in saying righteousness has the idea of fairness. I wonder, is this really a new idea? I take it that the equal distribution of grain is righteous because people deserve to have the food given to them. Such equal distribution of food is the right thing to do. It conforms to the norm of what is right. Second, I have my doubts. Maybe I will be convinced in our discussion that God's righteousness includes the notion of fairness in Romans 1.17. I think it is more likely that Paul limits himself to the saving righteousness of God in 1.17 and explains in 3.21-26 through 26 how the saving and judging righteousness of God meet in the cross. Frank is correct in saying words may be ambiguous and contain more than one shade of meaning, and yet it seems as if Frank's reading is too disjunctive, too jarring to be likely. For on his reading, righteousness in Romans 1.17 means both offering salvation and the giving of salvation, both the possibility of salvation and the creating of salvation. I agree with Frank that Paul refers to the righteousness of God that grants and creates salvation, and that this saving righteousness of God places people in the right before him. But then it seems unlikely that Paul also refers to the mere possibility of salvation. It demands quite a bit from the reader to see both the creation of and the possibility of salvation in the same phrase. It isn't that there can't be ambiguity. It is that the two ideas are dramatically different, one focusing on an accomplished reality, the other only on a potential reality that God's saving righteousness needs to be received, and that it is available to all people is communicated by other words in the context, not by dikaiosune theu. Yes, Paul emphasizes that God's saving righteousness is offered to all, but it doesn't follow from this that the definition of righteousness has the idea of an equal offer to all. Frank points out that the righteousness of God is prominent in 118 through 35 and says that this supports the idea that he is impartial. I think this is slightly, only slightly off kilter. God's righteousness in 118 through 35 focuses, as Frank acknowledges, on his righteousness in judging the ungodly. They are judged because they do not conform to his righteous and just character, because they violate his moral standards. 
The notion that God's righteousness consists in the equal offer of salvation is absent in these verses. Instead, the focus is on God's distributive justice, precisely the idea that Frank rejects in uh, 117. Frank's exploration of the meaning of the term in its Greco-Roman context is quite helpful. Paul would most likely be aware of how a term was used in the Greco-Roman world, and that may inform the meaning. Still, the fundamental background for deciphering, deciphering the meaning of God's righteousness is the Old Testament. It has often been pointed out that the language of righteousness and justification comes to the forefront in letters where the membership of Gentiles and the people of God is disputed. The debate centered on how one interpreted the Old Testament in the light of the Christ event. Further, Old Testament citations and allusions dominate the epistle to the Romans, and therefore the Old Testament must be the primary datum in investigating Pauline theology. At one point, Frank says that the meaning of righteousness of God must be found in part in the Greco-Roman world for, quote, Paul is unlikely to have written a letter that he knew would be unintelligible to most of his audience, unquote. Perhaps I misunderstand Frank here, but he seems to be suggesting that the letter could not be understood if Paul were simply and only referring to the Old Testament. I think this is doubtful. Paul engages constantly with the Old Testament in Romans, apparently assuming that his readers could follow his scriptural argumentation. Furthermore, many scholars think that the Gentiles in Romans were God-fearers, and if this is the case, they would have been quite familiar with the Old Testament. We can introduce Galatians as an analogy at this point. The Galatians were Gentiles, and yet the question that was disputed came from the Old Testament. Should the the recent Gentile converts be circumcised? Paul ransacked the Old Testament to, to defend his argument in Galatians, and it seems that he does something quite similar in Romans. I don't want to close on a negative note. I am not convinced by Frank's proposal, at least not yet. But perhaps upon further scrutiny, it will win the day. We should certainly be open to new light being shed upon the scriptures from all sources. And Frank defends his interpretation with clarity, grace, and an impressive array of evidence. Now I shift over over to Tom. I agree with much that is in Tom's paper, but for the sake of time, I will focus on a few matters. First, I agree that scripture is the final authority. Some Protestants... Some who love the Reformers do come off at times as Neo-Catholics. That is a danger Tom rightly warns us about. But at the same time, we must be careful, for our age hankers for what is new, and those who preceded us carefully read the Bible as well. Second, the eschatological character of Pauline thought is central. Eschatology informs everything in Paul's theology, and Tom is right to say this. Third, Maybe we are moving closer together on God's righteousness being ours in Christ. Tom seems to endorse here what Van Hooser says about being incorporated into Christ. I just want to say that both theologically and pastorally this truth is fundamental. We don't find comfort and assurance in ourselves and what we have accomplished, but in Christ's righteousness, which has been given to us when we are united with him. It would be helpful to hear Tom explain, if he accepts this idea, how it works out in Paul's theology, especially in terms of Paul's theology of the atonement. Along with this, I am delighted that Tom now speaks of the final judgment as one that will be in accordance with our works instead of on the basis of our works. Um, I I looked this up as you were speaking. I don't think you used the language of on the basis of our works, but on the basis of the totality of a life lived. So that is a little bit different expression. (laughs) But I think this adjustment and clarification is exactly right and does not contradict the idea that our righteousness is in Christ. I resonate with Tom when he says that we too quickly drown out what is said about the role of good works in the final judgment because of our tradition. And I am in full agreement with his formulation. We are judged according to our works, but not on the basis of our works. But we are not in the new heavens and new earth yet. We don't agree on everything, and some of the concerns raised in my first paper still exist. (laughs) Tom continues to think that justification is mainly about covenant membership and ecclesiology, whereas I think the primary emphasis is on soteriology with ecclesiological implications. But before we proceed further, I want to raise a question of definition. I am not clear, perhaps it's my own fuzziness, what Tom means by justification. He says it is forensic, but also has the idea of covenant membership. I understand what he means when he says righteousness is forensic. 
Justification means we are right with God. But I don't see how it can also mean that we are covenant members. I would argue that those who are justified are covenant members, but justification shouldn't be defined as covenant membership. Covenant membership is the result or consequence of being justified. Nor do I think Romans 4.11, where circumcision documents that one is righteous, supports the covenant membership view. The text does not say that circumcision ratifies that one is a covenant member, but that it confirms that one stands in the right before God by faith. An illustration may help. Baptism may document and ratify that one is saved, and those who are baptized are covenant members. But it doesn't follow logically or lexically from this that the word saved means covenant membership. I would say the same line of argument applies to circumcision and righteousness in Romans 4.11. In the time I have, I want to think briefly about two texts Tom raises, uh, Philippians 3 and Romans 4. First, Philippians 3. He says it is obvious in Philippians that the righteousness Paul rejects is not legalistic self-achievement. It is explicitly his membership in physical Israel. He acknowledges that there may be a kind of legalism here but says that it is not the detached legalism of the proto-Pelagian. Tom often refers to Pelagianism when refuting the old perspective. But it is instructive, I think, to reflect on the debates between the Reformers and their Catholic opponents. Those who opposed Luther weren't Pelagians. They were semi-Pelagians. Luther's opponents did not deny the grace of God, but advocated a synergism between grace and works that was rejected by Luther. The parallel between Paul and his Jewish opponents and Luther and his Catholic opponents may be more apt than Tom suggests. Paul's Jewish opponents had a theology of grace, too. They were not outright Pelagians, to speak anachronistically. But in Paul's view, their theology of grace was flawed and inadequate. Let's consider Philippians 3 further. Certainly Paul mentions privileges that belong to him from birth, such as circumcision, being from the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and a Hebrew of Hebrews. The new perspective reminds us that ethnic identity was an important feature of Pauline thought. But Paul does not restrict himself to ethnic and nationalistic matters. When Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee, he distinguishes himself from other Jews. And the point is that he was more devoted in his obedience than many of his compatriots. He makes this very point in Galatians 1.14. He was more zealous for the ancestral traditions than his contemporaries. Paul's zeal for the law was not only inherited, it was pursued. He lived it out by persecuting the church, by imprisoning and voting to execute believers in Christ whom he did not think were living in accord with the law. His obedience to the law is featured in his claim to have lived blamelessly in relation to it, 3.6. He boasted in his ethnic heritage and in what he did. His boast and reliance on the flesh cannot be confined to covenant privileges. Paul also concentrates on what he attained, on his extraordinary obedience. So when Paul speaks of my righteousness in 3.9, he is not merely saying that he was circumcised and Jewish, while Gentiles lack these things. He also thinks of what he has accomplished, of his so-called works that would commend him to God. Let me draw one implication from what Paul says. Jews didn't think they were better than Gentiles, solely because they were circumcised and were members of the covenant. They typically believed that they were more obedient and more godly than the Gentiles, that the Gentiles were judged not merely for being Gentiles, but because they were sinners. The close parallels between Philippians 3 and Romans 10 support this reading as well. Both texts refer to Israel. I'm not going to give the verses here because of time. Both texts refer to Israel, zeal, to one's own righteousness, as opposed to the righteousness of God, and to law righteousness over against faith righteousness. The striking correspondences in the text support the idea that there is a polemic against works righteousness. Paul specifically speaks of the righteousness that comes from doing in Romans 10.5 and opposes it to the righteousness by faith. In the same context, Romans 9.30-33, Paul contrasts righteousness by faith to works, and he says nothing in Romans 9.30-10.8 about boundary markers. I conclude that both Philippians 3 and Romans 10 fly in the same orbit contrasting righteousness which is secured through obedience to the law to righteousness given to one through faith. Tom and I still differ on Romans 4 as well. He turns the whole chapter, if I understand him correctly, into a discussion of covenant membership. But I want to argue that soteriology is the basis for ecclesiology. Perhaps he agrees with that. As I pointed out the other night, he has to insert the word we as the infinitive subject in 4.1. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's, it's in the verb, but I think to make it clear that we as the subject, Paul would need to uh, put the word hemas in there. 
the word Abraham is in there, which can naturally function uh, as the subject. Both Dunn and Jewett, neither of whom are advocates of the old perspective, reject this translation as well. Abraham is an example of how one becomes right with God in 4, 1 through 8, and thus becomes a pattern or example for Gentiles who are included in the covenant. Paul specifically contrasts works and faith in referring to Abraham in 4, 2, and 3. Abraham could boast if he did the requisite works. There is no evidence here that works means boundary markers. Circumcision comes up in 4, 9 through 12, but not in these verses. Paul doesn't speak of works of law, but of works, erga, in general. We should not narrow down what Paul has kept broad. Abraham would naturally boast of what he accomplished if his righteousness was obtained by what he did. Instead, he trusted and believed in God. Tom suggests that 4, 4, and 5 probably focuses on the inclusion of the Gentiles into the people of God rather than on Abraham himself. I think it is more accurate to say that Paul universalizes what was the case with Abraham. If Abraham was right with God by believing instead of working, then it follows that it is not those who work for God who are right with God. If righteousness were by works, then it is not by grace, Romans 11.6. Such righteousness would be a debt owed on the basis of the work accomplished, just as payment of a wage is a debt owed to an employee who worked the requisite hours. But that is not how it is with Abraham, nor with anyone else. It isn't the one who works for God who receives the wages of righteousness. For all, including Abraham, Joshua 24.2, are ungodly. One is not righteous before God by working for him, but by believing in him. David proves the point in 4.6-8. He was a covenant member, but he was not righteous by his works. He was guilty of the most flagrant sins. And it wasn't excluding Gentiles. He was counted righteous by faith. Tom rightly says that Genesis 15 begins by speaking of reward, and that reward is the inclusion of those who are as many as the stars of heaven. I don't disagree. But what Genesis 15 explains, and both Romans 4 and Galatians 3 emphasize, is that this reward will not be obtained fundamentally because of uh, Abraham's obedience, but because of his faith. I want to close by stating again how much we stand in debt to Tom for his contribution to scholarship. He is a trailblazing rocket taking us higher and deeper into the scriptures. But I would suggest that the trajectory of the rocket needs some adjustments. (laughs) Frank. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate those remarks. I want to thank both Tom Schreiner and Tom Wright for substantive presentations that will help to focus the discussion in the session ahead of us on some of the most difficult elements in Paul's justification language, areas which, because of their difficulty, have also produced vigorous debate. I think our goal in this session is not merely to pinpoint our differences from each other and defend our different positions but to listen to each other, learn from each other, and try to find common ground. In the end, we may simply need to agree to disagree on several issues, and some of them may be substantive. But we may also be surprised to find ourselves forging an alliance on important aspects of justification. It is worth emphasizing at the beginning that we already agree on much, both Tom Schreiner and Tom Wright have helpfully reminded us in their presentations that our traditional beliefs and practices, however cherished, should frequently pass through the searching light of Scripture, and where inconsistencies between our traditional beliefs and practices and Scripture emerge, then it is the traditions that must change. Protestant and particularly evangelical Christianity has lived for centuries with the uncomfortable tensions that this commitment to the sole authority of Scripture produces. But it is a necessary tension. Tom Wright in particular has urged us to resist the temptation to refuse to change our traditions when the exegesis of Scripture shows they must change. I think we all agree that this is salutary advice. I think the three of us on the panel, and I'm sure many more in the audience, also agree on the critical importance of biblical theology. 
If, um, <clears throat> if the Bible is the authoritative word of God, of God, then it is theologically coherent. And the carefully researched, philosophically sensitive work that Tom Wright has done in trying to show the continuity of God's purposes and Paul's theology from Adam to Abraham to Israel to the Messiah to the church is the right kind of work. We may disagree on how the narrative is structured, and particularly, as Tom Schreiner has suggested, on the precise role of Israel in the narrative, but that Scripture bears witness to a unified narrative is not in dispute. I think we also all agree on the importance of understanding the historical, linguistic, and cultural context in which the Bible was written in order to appreciate the nuances of its message. It's not that we need to download the latest academic journal article to find out every six months what we believe. The basic message of the Bible is clear without a lot of research. But part of the basic message itself is that God has revealed himself in human history. We do not have the theological option of bypassing historical investigation in our attempt to understand the scriptures. These are important areas of agreement, and they should offer encouragement that on the specific matter of justification, we may be able to find more common ground than one might suspect after consulting the theological flotsam and jetsam on the Internet. A signpost that points in this direction is the position of both Tom and Tom on the role of works in the eschatological justification of believers. Tom Schreiner pointed out in his presentation that he appreciated Tom Wright's understanding of the connection between works and justification. And this was also an area where John Piper found significant overlap with Wright. The principal point of disagreement that both Tom Schreiner and John Piper found with Wright lay in their belief that Wright understood works to be the basis of the believer's eschatological justification. Tom Wright has now clarified his own presenta- in his own presentation that this is not his understanding of the role of works in final justification. The final verdict, he argues, will be rendered according to works, not on the basis of them. And this is a position that has been taken over the centuries by uh, many traditional interpreters of Romans 2. Now, I'm one of those increasingly rare readers of Romans who thinks that Romans 2.13 is hypothetical and that Paul would probably not get this close to aligning works with justification in a setting where he were actually explaining how future justification will take place. I'm not very concerned, however, that my three friends, Tom, Tom, and John, do not agree with me on this. They make a pretty good case for their position. This seems to me to be a point on which we can have an invigorating and interesting exegetical discussion without the worry that someone's exegetical train has left the rails of theological orthodoxy. None of us believes that the believer's own works form the basis for final justification. To reach common ground, however, we have to understand where the significant differences lie. If we take the presentations by the two Toms as representative of their wider body of work, then the most critical difference seems to lie in what Paul means when he speaks of righteousness and of works of the law. When Paul says that God justifies the ungodly, does he primarily mean that God gives to ungodly Gentiles the status of belonging to his people? Or does he primarily mean that he gives to ungodly human beings, even the most pious of them, like Abraham, the righteous status of Christ? When Paul speaks of works of law or works of the law, is he interested chiefly in activities that characterize individuals who belong to Israel and to Israel's God, or principally in activities that belong to an individual human being? and define his or her status before God. I have used words like primarily and chiefly here because much of the difference between Tom Schreiner and Tom Wright, I think, is a matter of emphasis. 
Tom Schreiner does not deny that justification has ecclesiological implications, but believes that it is not primarily about ecclesiology. Tom Wright does not deny that God forgives the sins of those whom he justifies, but he believes that justification is not chiefly about the forgiveness of sins, but about the creation of a new multi-ethnic people of God. Still, there also seems to be an irreducible difference between them on this issue. For Tom Schreiner, when Paul speaks of justification by faith apart from works of the law, he is speaking in terms that emphasize the utter inability of human beings to receive acquittal in God's eschatological court on the basis of the good that they do and God's gracious provision to the believer of Christ's righteousness as a way out of the dilemma that this poses. For Tom Wright, when Paul speaks of justification by faith apart from works of the law, he is speaking in terms of the gracious inclusion of Gentiles with Jews in the people of God by their mutual union with Messiah Jesus and apart from anyone having to identify themselves as a Jew by practicing the Mosaic law. I suspect, however, that this irreducible core of disagreement on the meaning of Paul's justification language in Galatians and Romans does not really reflect a clash of opinions at the theological level about the depth of human depravity, the nature of God's gracious forgiveness of human sin through Christ's atoning death, the role of faith in the human appropriation of God's saving grace, and even the critical implication all this has for the union of Jews and Gentiles in one people of God. I suspect this because I would be surprised if Tom Schreiner and Tom Wright have radically different readings of Ephesians 2 and 3. We might quibble about the antecedent of the first and second person pronouns in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Does we refer to we Jews and you to you Gentiles? Or about whether the dividing wall of hostility in Ephesians 2.14 refers to the balustrade that kept Gentiles out of the inner area of the temple. But I think that we can all agree on three aspects of these two chapters. First, that the main emphasis of 2.1-10 is the salvation of the individual from sin and death by faith in Christ and apart from human effort. Now, Tom may well want to nuance that to take out the more individualistic reference there, but I think you would agree that the, the thoughts and the, uh, the wills and so on that are referred to in the first part of that section refer to activities of the individual that Paul identifies with uh, sin and transgression. Uh, second, I think we would all agree that the main emphasis of 2.11 to 22 is on the union of Jewish and Gentile believers into one people of God across ethnic boundaries defined by the Mosaic law. And third, that Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 assigns to the church the important task, and of course the word church, ecclesia, is used there, the important task of proclaiming to God's enemies in heavenly places that through the reuniting of humanity with God and with each other, the evil powers, evil purposes have been defeated. Paul does not use righteousness language to describe any of this. Dikaios and its cognates do not appear in Ephesians until chapter 4, verse 24, and there the righteousness language is used in a very common ethical sense. Yet, from a theological perspective, as Tom Wright recognizes in his book on justification, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, is about justification. Wright defines justification here a bit differently than Schreiner probably would. He calls it God's declaration that someone is in the right, is a member of the sin-forgiven covenant family. But since he includes the forgiveness of sins in this description, he comes close to a traditional understanding of justification. At some point in our discussion this morning, I would be interested to hear Tom and Tom talk about Ephesians 2, and particularly Ephesians 2, 
1 through 10. I believe we would all be pretty much in agreement. There may be nuanced differences here, but pretty much in agreement on the basic theological contours of that important section of this important letter. And what better place to come together as believers than in discussing a passage from the letter that urges us to speak the truth in love and provides very practical advice on how to do that. In short, it seems to me that we do have real differences among ourselves, and these differences are not unimportant. We also, however, may have fewer differences than we think we do, and our task, as I see it, is to find out where we agree and how we can move forward together in the proclamation of the great truths of the gospel that unite us. Yeah, good thing. Thank you very much, and I want to thank Frank and Tom very much for their responses as well as their, for their original papers, but I also want to apologize because their papers arrived just a day or so before I had to leave to uh, come to the States. I've been on the road for nearly two weeks now, and while I was in Dallas, my computer died, um, and I, for several days when I might have been working on this, I, I didn't, and happily, um, it had a, had a Lazarus moment when I was in Vancouver, and um, it is now back from the dead, although slightly shaky and pale, and uh, so I haven't actually got, as they have, a neat, polished, written out um, response to them. But So I'm going to wing this and do it as clearly and briefly as I think I can. Um, I was thrilled with Frank's coins, not Frank's coins, but those Roman coins to which Frank has drawn our attention. Um, Maybe some of them are for sale on the open market. Some, um, for, some for first century coins you can get quite cheaply. It'd be fun to have them. Um, and I've, as I've often found with Frank's work um, over many years, I find myself thinking, uh, why didn't I go and look for those? Why didn't I? You know, I'm really, really grateful that Frank has done that homework and uh, has drawn these to our attention. Um, but I found myself saying, uh, the opposite of what Tom Schreiner said about Frank, because actually I think that if you follow through Romans in the light of the potential meanings that come up out of the Aquitas or Dicas, you know, whatever on those coins, then actually that plays much more closely into my reading of Romans and of Abraham and so on. And I had a sense, Frank, that um, as you were going through, you kind of left the coins sitting there, and that's very interesting, but then um, came back to sort of safe ground when, just when I wanted you to push on and explore a bit further, because from my point of view, um, the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17, yes, it's polyvalent, yes, it does have several nuances and meanings, and Paul often does that with a dense, cryptic opening statement, which then has to be unpacked, we all know that, but that those meanings are much closer to one another than I either of you, I think, allowed for, and I mean, you said, Tom, that it was kind of uh, jerky or awkward to get from the one to the other, because if I'm anywhere near right, then the covenant faithfulness of Israel's God, Abraham's God, is precisely his faithfulness to the covenant with Israel on the basis of which he will deal fairly with Jews and Gentiles, and that theme is so prominent in Romans 2, Romans 3, and Romans 4, that it seems to me there is a nice, easy way across so that though you could say that the Caesar meaning is a sort of secularized flattening out of that larger polyvalent Old Testament uh, Tzedakah Elohim, as in Isaiah or the Psalms or whatever, um, th that's fair enough. It is a meaning that the Roman audience would have got, but from there there is a straight bridge into precisely the detailed theological, biblically rooted meanings which Paul has in mind. So as I've often found, once we get beyond the sterile antithesis of a, a, a pagan, Heils, a pagan um, Religionsgeschichte or a Jewish Religionsgeschichte, you know, where is Paul deriving this from? Is it from pagan sources or Jewish? We say no, he's deriving this stuff deeply from his scriptural heritage, his Jewish heritage, but he discovers that it addresses and actually trumps stuff that's out there in the pagan world. And so the analogy for me there would be um, when Paul uses uh, Son of God language, Kyrios language, these are clearly for him Old Testament words with Christologically focused but still Old Testament meanings, but he discovers and exploits the fact that they subvert the Caesar meaning of Son of God and Kyrios. And actually I think that's a wonderful and exciting thing which there is probably much more of in, in Scripture than we've, than we've normally allowed for. Um, so there's so much in, in Frank's work here, uh, as always, that I, that I found so 
happy. Um, but it's particularly when we talk about the gift of righteousness. Um, I, I fear in what Frank has written here that when we use the word gift, um, there is something that can be said about that. The righteous status is a gift, we haven't earned it, etc., etc. But it still leaves us with this idea of righteousness as a sort of thing that gets passed around. I've got some righteousness, quite a lot of it actually, and I'm able to give some of it to you and then you'll be all right as well. And I think that's a large step away from precisely that law court metaphor which Paul sets up so carefully in Romans 3. It isn't a casual metaphor just that, that trips off the tongue, like that phrase trips off the tongue is a metaphor from walking and tripping. Um, you know, it's, just, it, it's, it's a metaphor which is very deeply rooted in Paul's whole uh, exposition at that point. And that makes a nice uh, transition or segue into what I want to say, uh, among the many things I'd like to say to, to Tom Schreiner, um, apart from just thanking him for his graciousness and the way that here and elsewhere he has bent over backwards to try to find points of contact and things that we can affirm together with each other. And, and yeah, face it, this is an in-house discussion. You know, here we are. We all believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. So this is basically rock and roll, as I said, and then we're enjoying that. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's important rock and roll. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea of, of the gift, um, I think, doesn't take that law court context seriously. And Tom, there are a few points in your paper where I just felt as though you were, you were using, um, uh, you were implying that the law court metaphor was, as it were, one metaphor among others and we shouldn't push it too hard. And I want to say, actually, it's Paul who's pushing it hard in Romans 3, uh, not me or not you or not anyone else. And this gets back to the point about Paul's actual arguments, that again and again, when in your paper you're talking about my apparent antithesis of ecclesiology and soteriology, I want to say, as I said just now, only perhaps more strongly, um, that of course soteriology is there all through. If there isn't a soteriology, what on earth are we doing talking about this stuff? Let, let's, let's go and do something else, more, more sort of sensible or, or worthwhile. If, if Christ is not raised, etc., we are of all people most to be pitied. But the actual argument that Paul is mounting, you can't just pull bits out and make them address questions from a different era, which I still think is going on. I actually think that the reformers did, you know, they did a wonderful job of giving better answers to questions that people were asking at the end of the 15th and the early 16th century. But they didn't always question as deeply as they might have done why those questions were in that form or what the words like justitia, righteousness, actually were meaning at the time. And I think if they pushed harder on that, then the answers that they were giving to those medieval questions could have actually reshaped the questions more thoroughly. And that's, in a sense, what, what, I'm, what I'm actually pleading for. Um, so let, let me get to a few specifics about that. Um, it is interesting. I, I want to hear more from Tom Schreiner about um, the narrative, the large narrative, because I hear you affirming the goodness of a large narrative and not a disjointed one. And I hear you affirming, I confess rather to my surprise, that you like the stuff about exile because certainly some of your close colleagues don't like it one little bit. And it would be fun to find out whether you actually have that conversation behind closed doors at Southern Seminary ever and so on. Um, <laughs> I just don't know. It would be, that would be very interesting. Um, but uh, it, it, one of the key bits in your paper, key to me, is when you talk about Abraham as an example. And that is a classic Protestant way of reading Romans 4 or Genesis 3. But I want to say that really isn't what Abraham is doing in Paul's actual argument. As I say, Romans, uh, Galatians 3.29, the climax of it is, if you are the Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed. QED. Abraham is not an example. What matters is whether or not you're part of Abraham's family. And when I say what matters, I mean what matters in Paul's argument in Galatians. I'm not saying it matters if you ask the question, um, are, you going to be part of, are you going to be raised from the dead and be part of God's new heavens and new earth? I would still bring Abraham strongly into that, unlike most of my critics who seem to have to be persuaded to allow Abraham to poke his head above the parapet now and again. I would still have Abraham pretty strongly in there. But of course, I would talk about Jesus Christ and ourselves as sinners and what God has done in and through the Messiah for us. But in this argument that Paul is mounting, which as I say, we mustn't demythologize, then it's clear that the question of belonging to Abraham is front and center. So I, again, as with 
um, a life lived in accordance with works, I would say actually it's Paul who's talking about ecclesiology in these passages. He is presupposing soteriology in order to talk about ecclesiology. And I do not find myself at liberty to say what Paul was really talking about was something other than what he in fact was. And this comes to a a particular climax when we're discussing um, in, in Tom's paper the business of Israel as the answer to the world's problems. I agree, of course, that a lot of Jewish texts, both in the Old Testament and in the Second Temple period, do not explicitly say that. But what I insist is that for Paul, and for many other New Testament writers, this particular reading of Israel's Israel's place in the purposes of God is actually very strong and clear. And the idea of going back to Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, which Paul does, is that you precisely invoke the Genesis narrative according to which the problem is set in Genesis 3 and the problem enlarges itself to the point of Babel in Genesis 11. And God calls Abraham, and whoever put the book of Genesis into its present form, um, it's clear that they had this in mind as a matter of the whole narrative. This is the answer to the problem. And so it isn't just about Abraham as an example of how somebody gets saved or whatever. It is somehow this guy is bearing a promise which will undo the Genesis 3 and Genesis 11 thing. My favorite rabbinic quote from Genesis Rabbah, where a rabbi puts into God's mouth the phrase, I will make Abraham first, and if he goes, I will make Adam first, and if he goes wrong, I will send Abraham to sort it all out. I think that Paul would have agreed, except that Paul would then have said, the trouble is Abraham too is in Adam. And so God must send the Messiah to do for Abraham and his seed what they were supposed to do for the world. And if you get that straight, then Romans comes up in three dimensions in a way that it never does any other way in my lifelong experience. This brings me particularly to something that I didn't say so clearly in my paper, but as Tom and Frank know, I've written about in various places, the role of Romans 2, 17 and following within the argument. Because as Protestants, and indeed Catholics do this as well, we have assumed that Romans 1.18 to 3.20 is basically saying all have sinned, as in the summary in 3.23, we've not noticed the particular nuance in 2.17 following. If you call yourself a Jew, Edisu Yudal Sephonomadze, and boast in God, Kaukase and Theo, and you know his will, and know that you are a teacher of the foolish and a guide to the blind and a light to those in darkness. This is the boast of the Jew, not just I've got the Torah so I'm okay. It's that I am the answer to the problem of those guys out there in 1.18 to 2.16. We Jews are, because we've got the Torah, God's rescue operation. And Paul says, well, how come you need rescuing yourself then? Because if the boast were to be made good, there should be no stealing, no murder, no adultery, no temple robbing, etc. in Israel. But there is, therefore Israel can't be the answer to the world's problems. And this is particularly so in Romans 3, 1 and following. Uh, What's the point of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, I actually wish I could have done a whole paper on this. To begin with, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And many Jews of Paul's day might not have seen it like that. They might have been going the piety rather than politics route. We Jews have got Torah, so we're just going to stay in our huddle and we'll be holy and the rest of the world can can go to hell in a handbasket. But no, Paul's vision of it is the Jews were entrusted. Episteu Thesan. Now, if I entrust you with a letter, the letter is not for you, it's for somebody else. I could entrust you with a a message for Frank, and your job is to pass it on to Frank. Now, Israel is entrusted with the oracles of God, so that Israel's faithlessness, um, what if some were unfaithful, as he immediately says, is not that they didn't believe, they didn't have faith, they were not faithful to that commission. And if you take Romans 3 in that way, you'll find that the whole of the rest of the thing makes far more integrated, tight, sense. It is in Jesus Christ the faithful one. He has been faithful to God's purpose and therefore through him and his saving death the blessing comes upon the Gentiles not soteriology versus ecclesiology. And this comes particularly in Tom's paper on pages hmm, 16, 17 I've got it here the stuff about plan A and plan B where he rightly says that I rightly say that if you had um, (laughs) sorry it's just the way it goes um, that, uh, the, 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 if you have God, you know, some older commentator, even Sandy and Hedlam, one of the greatest of pairs of British commentators from 120, whatever it was, years ago, said in commenting on Romans 4, uh, Romans 10, 4, that God had given Israel the law, but it had become clear by now that this was really far too difficult for people to keep, so God gave them an easier way, namely faith. <laughs> 
well, excuse me, quite apart from anything else, ask Richard Dawkins if faith is that easy. I mean, faith is not actually easier than the law. Faith is a gift of God itself. That's another point. But um, that is bad theology. The idea of God flailing around, let's try this way. No, that doesn't work. Let's do something quite different. Um, But then... um, Uh, uh, Tom Schreiner says that God's gift of the law was to illustrate the truth that salvation couldn't come through obedience to the law. And I I want to say again, that's the first little step on a demythologizing road. It's illustrating a general truth. It's making Israel an example of something rather than the people who are actually bearing the promise. So this is back to the whole question of the single narrative. And uh, uh, you say, Tom, on the top of your Sorry, the page numbers didn't print too well here. 17, I think it is. Um, You say that I could be accused of having a plan A and plan B because plan A, God intended to bless the world through Israel, but that didn't work, so God accomplished his purposes through Jesus in plan B. That is precisely the question Paul addresses in Romans 9 to 11. It's because of that problem that he addresses that uh, um, in in those chapters. And actually, I want to say, as I said in my paper, um, God's original purpose was to bless creation through humankind there in Genesis 1 and 2. That messed up, so God calls Abraham to sort that out. He messes up, so God sends Jesus to sort that out. Ching, ching, ching. Paul fits that together amazingly, symphonically, in the letter to the Romans. So it, it, the, 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 the overarching narrative is really the thing, and clarifying that. This is, of course, what was issue, at issue between Luther and Calvin. For Luther, it was a plan A and plan B. For Calvin, there was one plan, God always intended to do it this way. And all the paradoxes that we see were, for Calvin, all part of that plan. I'm with Calvin on this one. And I'm quite happy to put my hand up and say, of course, Anglicans are basically Calvinists. You all knew that. Um, (laughs) So, um, I, I do agree with what Frank said about Ephesians 2 and 3. And actually, I think, as Protestants, we have often, even though we've maintained as evangelicals that Paul probably wrote Ephesians, um, uh, we have often fallen into the same trap that uh, the, the, the liberal Protestants fall into, that Ephesians has too high an ecclesiology for us, and so we kind of back off, and we, let it, we, we use Ephesians to fill in the gaps in Romans and Galatians. And I've often thought, you know, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, God's purpose is to sum up all things in Christ, things in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 2 verse 10, um, God's plan so that by grace you are saved for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 3 verse, this is a preacher's trick, Ephesians 3 verse 10, (laughs) that through the church, exactly, that's the passage my first two years as a bishop, I preached on that passage more than any other, that through the church the many splendid wisdom of God would be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Um, That's just the most stunning exposition of what it's all about. If Luther and Calvin had taken Ephesians 1 to 3 rather than Romans 1 to 3 or Galatians 1 to 3 as their starting point, the entire history of the Western Church would have been different. Thank you. Thanks to each of you. We'd now like to move into a segment here where we'll give you opportunity to interact with each other. There's such a vast array of important topics to discuss, and we could just open it straight up for anything. But I think what I'd like to do is begin with the topic of the righteousness of God, which is uh, front and center in this debate. And there is some difference among the three of you and would uh, like to just zero in on that for a moment and um, who would like to begin. Maybe Frank, uh, since Tom had the floor last. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the response of both Toms. There's a lot to think about there and uh, appreciate greatly uh, the seriousness which they have, with which we, they have taken our work. Um, Uh, Let me just say, with respect to my argument about the righteousness of God being the fairness of God in Romans 1.17, I I think that we have to read that phrase, first of all, in the light of Romans 1.14-16, which does talk about the outreach of the gospel to all sorts of human beings. And I'm talking about all sorts of human beings, Gentiles, Jews, um, barbarians, 
you know, wise and unwise and so on. When I, when, I, when I speak universally, that's what I'm speaking about. And then in the, after that phrase is used, as Paul develops righteousness language in the rest of chapter 1 and in chapter 2, I think he does develop it in the direction of uh, distributive justice. He talks about the punishment of the sinner when he uses that language. So I think it's a, this is a both and uh, that we've got going on there, and I think that sets up the, the reason why in 321 to 26, Paul needs to address the, uh, the question of how the offer of salvation can be made freely to all sorts of people on one hand, all of whom are wicked, um, and the other hand, God can be a just God who judges all according to their works. How does that happen? How, how can he be just and have that happen? Well, in the atoning death of Christ, that problem is rectified, I think, in 321 to 26. Um, also, with respect to the, the Paul's use of the Old Testament and uh, particularly his indebtedness to the Old Testament in his development of the understanding of the righteousness of God. Let me just say, I think it's Paul's understanding of the righteousness of God is profoundly indebted to the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.4 already shows that. And I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't talk about that a great deal in my um, talk, but it's certainly true. And I think um, much of what Tom Wright and Tom Schreiner have said about the indebtedness of Paul to the Old Testament and his use of that phrase is, is right on target. So I think the, pra- the phrase is polyvalent. I think it's used in several different ways. I think it was shaped by Paul's understanding of the Old Testament, and this, I think, is where Tom Wright's work in particular is so helpful because he shows us how Paul took phrases and concepts that were common coin, common currency in the culture and used the biblical narrative to redefine those and shape those. So that uh, whereas many people who first heard Romans read uh, were illiterate and probably did not know the Old Testament terribly well, um, I think Paul got very busy, if Paul and his co-workers got very busy instructing people on what the Old Testament narrative was and then began redefining uh, phrases that they were familiar with, like dikaiosune, uh, and I would even add tutheyu, although, you know, that phrase doesn't crop up in the inscriptions and so on. But we have to remember that the woman holding the scales on those coins was a goddess. Um, So for them to read the righteousness of God would not, I think, have been odd for them. They thought, you know, various people prior to becoming Christians who were pagans would have understood uh, some gods, at least, to be righteous or to represent righteousness. But then Paul gets very busy immediately instructing them on what the Bible has to say, basically, what the what the Jewish scriptures have to say about the righteousness of God. So he, re- he redefines it. But I think folded into his redefinition, there continues to be this notion resonating around that God is fair. And, um, and he is fair in uh, quitting the guilty because of the death of Christ. So let me just stop there and pass the mic along. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate so, so many aspects of both Frank's thought and Tom's thought. I, there's a lot in common, even, even though I have some reservations about uh, what Frank says regarding fairness. It seems to me at the end of the day, the difference, if I'm understanding him correctly, isn't, isn't great. So I, I'm going to push on, push on another, another area here that I think might be helpful for the discussion I, I pointed out in my paper the parallels between Philippians 3 and Romans 10. And we read in Philippians 3 that it's a dikaiosune, dikaiosune ek theu, uh, from God. I take it 
that means it's a gift of God. Now, in my understanding, the many parallels that we see with Romans 10 between those two passages, and I cited those, I think that leads us to the conclusion that when Paul's speaking of the Kaisune Theu in Romans 10, he's thinking of the same thing. And it's talking about the gift of God. Now, I'm sort of marching backwards here, but I think it's helpful. I think it's uh, indicative of what Paul is doing. Therefore, there's a lot of steps along the way here, but I'm going quickly. Therefore, I think it's legitimate in Romans 1, 17, 3, 21, and 22, to read that righteousness there as well as a gift of God that is, that is given to us. I don't think we ought to press the, the, the lack of the, uh, the eck in Romans to say that it is something remarkably uh, different. So, so what is the righteousness of God? I, I agree it's a saving power, but I also think it's, and I think Frank agrees with this. I'm not, I'm not sure if you agree with this. We'll hear in a minute. Um, I, um, I think it's also a gift of God that is given to us, and, and, and here's, here's where I want to press Tom a little bit. I, I, think, I think the difference between us is Tom takes extra steps, in my mind, that I don't see clearly there in the text. So we're, we're all arguing from the text. What is the text actually saying? I think to say it's saying covenant membership is, is a step beyond uh, the, the language that righteousness is given to us as a gift. We're given God's righteousness. He has, he has saved us and delivered us from sin. I don't think that is the same thing as covenant membership. I think, that's a, I think covenant membership is a result and consequence of that. And... I'm, we're just throwing lots of things out, aren't we? Uh, but I'm, but I think I think that Tom tends to do that because he's such a so good at thinking of the big picture. So so he he puts things together that, in terms of the big picture, I'm in I'm in agreement with in so many respects. But then there's these little steps along the way here and there that I and maybe they t- end up being big steps in terms of defining words that I don't see clearly, clearly in the text. So, I mean, I'm open. I'm open to that, but I, I don't think it's clear. Uh, so, I probably said enough. I, I'm, uh, I'm, really, I'm really grateful that Tom has gone to Philippians 3 and Romans 10 because I'd written those down as the, as the two key places here. And I'm sorry in a way that we didn't do more on Romans 10, I in my paper at least, because there the, the subject is salvation. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is is soterion, unto salvation. And uh, the whole argument through to verse 13 is about salvation. So that you, if you look at the, 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 the actual words that come in verse 9, if you um, confess with the lips, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto dikaiosune, and with the mouth one confesses unto soteria. Um, and he emphasizes it. All who believe in him will not be put to shame. No distinction between Jew and Greek. Same Lord is Lord of all. And then quotes from Joel 3, for all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is about salvation. That's the argument. That's the shape of the argument. Unlike Galatians 3, which is about who is a member in the family of Abraham. Fine. What is then the inner argument that gets him from 10.1 to 10.13? It, is, it, it, it turns on his exegesis of Deuteronomy 30. What is going on in Deuteronomy 30? If you look right through, okay, Second Temple period, but including the the Biblical Second Temple material and the post-Biblical Second Temple material, Deuteronomy 30 is a massive text. It's something that conditions the way that so many Jews in that period understood where they were, who they were, and what the big story they were living in was all about. Because Deuteronomy 30 comes at the end of that four-chapter covenantal scheme which says, here are the blessings, here are the curses. Um, I know that you'll get some of the blessings first, but you're going to mess up and then you'll get the curses. And the curses will end with exile, Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And when you're in exile, when at last you turn to the Lord with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength, then he will return to you and then he will bring you back and he will renew the covenant with you. And that is when you will say, this law isn't so hard that we have to go up to heaven or down into the sea to get it because the word will be near near you on your lips and in your heart. That text from Deuteronomy 30 is so important right across Second Temple Judaism aligned with Daniel 9 which is the prayer for return from exile but it will happen in 490 years rather than 70. That's a text which was well known. So when Paul then says Deuteronomy 30 is fulfilled when somebody believes in Jesus' 
has risen from the dead and confesses that he is Lord, he is saying this is the Deuteronomic covenant. And the, the Pentateuch is shaped with the covenant with Abraham at the beginning and then this Mosaic Deuteronomic covenant at the end. And he's holding on to that whole thing. And it's in the light of that that I want to say, um, it's actually very funny to accuse me of importing one little word, namely we, into Romans 4 verse 1, when you import the little word ek into Dikazunethu in Romans 1, 17, 3, 21, etc. Because the phrase tzedakah Elohim or Dikazunethu in the Psalms and in Isaiah particularly, and also in some of those funny Second Temple texts, which we know and love, um, then it's, uh, 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 it, it means God's own faithfulness to the covenant. The Lord has made bare his holy arm, he's revealed his righteousness. Read Isaiah, what's that about? He has revealed the fact that he is Israel's God, and as such is going to act on behalf of Israel in order to do new creation. Look at the sequence of thought in Isaiah 52, 53, 54, and 55. The announcement of the kingdom of God and the revelation of, his, of, of all those attributes in 52. The final work of the servant dying on behalf of sinners in 53. The renewal of the covenant in 54. The renewal renewal of the creation in 55. Now, I didn't make this stuff up. I mean, it's, it's just sitting there in the text. So when Paul says in Romans 1.17, God's righteousness is unveiled in it, I want to say to Kazeman as well as to, to others, yes, this is very closely cognate with God's saving power, but the word dikaizune does not mean saving power. Saving power is God's power unto salvation, dunamis isoteria. But the righteousness is the thing that drives that. It's because God is faithful to the covenant with Israel that that happens. Therefore, Romans 10.3, this was where I came in nearly 30 years ago. They are ignorant of God's righteousness. In other words, they are ignorant of God's purpose promised to Abraham, now fulfilled in Jesus Christ for all people. That's what he's been talking about in Romans 9, 6 through to the end of, uh, end of chapter 9. They don't understand that. That's what they're ignorant of. And they are seeking to establish tenedian dikaiosunein, in other words, a status of covenant membership which would be for them and them only. That's their problem. That is then demolished because they're sinful and they need saving, but that's what they've been trying to do. Therefore, Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness, the telos, the goal, the fulfillment. And so his reading of Leviticus and Deuteronomy strongly supports the fact that in this passage which is about salvation the heart of the matter is God's faithfulness to the covenant as a result of which he's renewed it in and through Jesus so I'd love, we haven't got time, I'd love to have the further discussion with Tom and Frank about that passage because actually Romans 10, 1 to 13 is one of the most spectacular pieces of writing in an already spectacular letter Good, quick response um, I, I really think um, Tom's analysis of Romans 10 is very helpful and appreciate the, um, the way he anchors it back into Deuteronomy 30. I think that's a, a very important move, and I, um, I tend to agree with that, although I think I, I would still agree with Tom about um, the... <laughs> Tom, sorry, Tom Schreiner... <laughs> about uh, the phrase his own righteousness because it does seem to me to be so uh, analogous to the Philippians 3 passage where that verbiage is also used and then where you have the ek theu expressed. So I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, thing to do to add the ek in. I'd also like to hear what uh, Tom Wright um, what you think about the the dikaios in Romans one seventeen and why we have this move from dikaiosune theu to now the individual person actually who is a dikaios. So that, that's that's surely quite easy. That um, the, the the dikaios person in Habakkuk 2, and there's been a lot of stuff done on this, and I and you and others have we've all written on it, and the Dikaios person is, uh, here is Israel in big trouble. The pagans are coming in, they're sweeping through the land. Who are going to be God's people in the middle of this? Um, the Dikaios, the righteous one, the Tzadik, is the one who holds on by faith, and there, there will be the life. Um, that's, that's not a problem. And Habakkuk is not saying um, that this person is Dikaios because God's own dikazune or tzedakah, whatever that might mean, 
has been somehow gifted to that person. The status of dikaios has been gifted, but it isn't God's own status of dikaios. Even if you take out the law court stuff, um, when you say that this Israelite is dikaios, it doesn't mean that this Israelite has been faithful to the covenant, has, has released, has redeemed Israel, has followed through his purpose to Abraham. No, that's God's job. This person is dikaios because they're, they're, they're recognized as a true Israelite. 